What up, y'all? It's your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio, live from Dubai for Tuesday, September 20th, 2016, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, on Twitter at the Enter Report, or on Instagram at the Entertainment Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com, or your iHeart phone app, search for the entertainment report, and it'll take you to the page. Comedian and actor Jim Carrey says a wrongful death lawsuit filed by the estranged husband of his ex-girlfriend is a heartless attempt to exploit him and vow to fight the case. Mark Burton of Portland sued Carrey in a Los Angeles Superior Court on Monday, accusing the actor of providing the prescription drugs that his wife, Katharina White, used to overdose in September 2015. The wrongful death lawsuit contends Carrey improperly obtained prescriptions for Ambien and the powerful opiate oxycodone under the alias Arthur King. The suit accuses Carrie of giving White the medication days before she was found dead in one of Carrie's homes. White and Carrie dated in 2012 and were photographed together in May 2015. Carrie wrote in a statement, what a terrible shame. It would be easy for me to get in a back room with this man's lawyer and make this go away, but there are some moments in life where you have to stand up and defend your honor against the evil in this world. Carrie also wrote, I will not tolerate this heartless attempt to exploit me or the woman I loved. I really hope that someday soon people will stop trying to profit from this and let her rest in peace. The coroner's officials ruled the 30-year-old makeup artist's death a suicide. Byrne and White were married in 2000. 13. A coroner official told reporters that the pair were separated and planned to divorce. However, Burton's attorney, Michael Evanati, declined to characterize their relationship beyond saying that they were legally married at the time of White's death. The lawsuit accused Carey of violating a section of California's Health and Safe Code against the use of aliases to obtain prescription medication. The lawsuit states White's death was tragic and easily avoidable. For one night only, Angela Lansbury served audiences a live performance as Mrs. Potts. The actress revived her beloved character from the Disney animated musical Beauty and the Beast during the 25th anniversary screening Sunday at Lincoln Center in New York. In a video of the event posted online, Lansbury sang the musical title track and sweetly capped off the performance with a few lines from the film. Run along and get in the cupboard chip. It's time you was in bed. Night, night. Lansbury was accompanied by Beauty and the Beast composer Alan Macon on the, on the piano for the spontaneous post-screening performance. Other voice actors in attendance at the event include Paige O'Hara, Robbie Benson, and Richard White, who respectively played Belle, Beast, and Gaston in the 1991 film. Summer may well be and truly over in London, but the fashion crowd is already looking forward to what's hot next spring. Jasper Conrad, Julian McDonald, and Amelia Wickstead were among the labels showcasing their new season collections on the second day of London's Fashion Week, which also saw Versus by Versace return to the event. An autumn chill is in the air, but for 15 minutes, everyone at Jasper Conrad's show enjoyed a mini holiday in sunnier climes. The British designer evoked the romantic summer escapade with a cool collection of crisp shirt dresses flowering uh, chaff dents, uh, elegant ankle-length A-line skirts and pinafores, all worn with flat nude sandals, carefree tote bags, and unfussy updutes. The shape were modern and minimal, letting the giant ginham checks and geometric pleatings do all the talking. The standout look was big bulb stripes and crisp white with cherry red, bright blue, and sunny yellow. The show closed with a series of pretty sheared pastel evening dresses, all embroiled with delicate flowers. Versus the spin-off label Versace, Return to the London show circuit with a new collection promising real attitude. That's clear from the very first outfit that opened the show, a smoldering all-black ensemble of five bearing hot pants, a leather jacket, and knee-high biker boots. This is fierce, aggressive femininity, all shine black leather adorned with big buckles, silver hardware, and chokers. And came sporty olive green nylon coats and cropped cocky bombers with plaited shoulders worn with aviator sunglasses and the haughtiest of pouts. There wasn't much color, and when it did appear, it made a big impact. Think of an outfit of a barely there broad top, skinny jeans, and parka, all in a striking mangle yellow. This being Versace, animal prints can be a miss, this time in the form of a vertical stripe patchwork print. The evening wear that closed the show continued the young urban vibe, featuring a slinky silver and torn denim, a combo that Donatella Versace herself chose to wear for her curtain call. Julian McDonald says he was thinking glamour, sexy, rock and roll for his London cat walk show. Glamorous it was and sexy too, with models wearing uh, skin-tight, cut 
cutaway dresses with only the sheerest, smallest of bodysuits underneath uh, to give them that all-important no-underwear look. There was plenty of skin on display, and much of it was smeared with Vaseline and intentionally over-the-top flake uh, tans, giving the exposed cleavage and necks an unearthly post cuing glow. The model's long hair was drenched with product. That feels good, one said with ob- obvious relief as she rinsed her hair fresh after the show. Uh, designer Amelia Wickstead put a welcome bra- uh, break on the catwalk as spectacle trend with a subtle show that celebrated fem- femininity without putting it on raucous display. Wickstead used a series of subtle pale hues and a dreamy uh, chiffony drape to give some of her full-length dress a classic timeless feel. There was beauty in the detail and a welcome sense of restraint. The models even wore comfortable flat shoes that were able to walk in without evident pain. Um, giving the show a relaxed feel. Those imaginative jumpsuits, nicely tailored, and some stomach-bearing outfits that inadvertently showed off a few of the model's tattoos, which weren't part of the design but served to humanize the show. When Wickstead did Im- indulge in bright color-, color, she made some creative mixes, pairing orange with a dark pink, and using splashy polka dot dots to set up some outfits. A few dresses harkened back to the 1960s n- uh, nostalgia, but she was in light of it. Uh, Game of Thrones actress Rose Leslie having a Prosecco after attending the show with a friend says we were very excited very enthused her friend added would she want the outfits of course who wouldn't and david beckham made another foray into the world of fashion this time working with british heritage brand kent and kerwin to debut its new men's wealth menswear collection the always immaculately groomed former soccer star wore a small a smart navy coat for his appearance at london's fashion week saturday to help promote the brand which he part owns kent and kerwin described the clothes as a meeting of heritage and modernity and fitting there is a strong sporty element think stripe rugby shirts, t-shirts, and casual outdoorsy jackets. Mark Jacobs has apologized for his response to criticism over showcasing his models in dreadlocks during the final day of the New York Fashion Week. The white designer was criticized on social media immediately after mostly a white lineup of models was outfitted with rainbow dreadlocks for his Thursday show. Some accused Jacobs of appropriating black culture. A screen grab shows Jacobs responding to his critics on Instagram by saying it was funny that they don't criticize women of color for straightening their hair. Jacobs also wrote that he doesn't see color or race and that he was Sorry to read that so many people are narrow-minded. Jacobs apologized Sunday on, on Instagram for what he calls the, quote, the lack of sensitivity unintentionally expressed by my privity. Amal Clooney is pushing for the United Nations to investigate and prosecute Islamic State group commanders for genocide. Clooney wants the Islamic State group leaders tried over the killings. The British lawyer appeared on NBC's Today Show in an interview broadcast Monday alongside a Yazidi woman who was captured by the IS group in 2014 but escaped. The the woman, 23-year-old Nadia Murad, says she was raped and she prayed for death while in captivity. Murad was named UN's Goodwill Ambassador last week. The UN estimates that some 5,000 Yazidi men have been killed by IS group militants and thousands more people have been taken into captivity. Clooney says she discussed her, uh, her husband, George Clooney, with her husband, George Clooney, her effort to legally fight the IS group. She says he understands this is my work. And in a related story, Leonardo DiCaprio, Stevie Wonder, Michael Douglas, and the other stars plead for peace and the survival of the planet Friday, which Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says is closer to conflict than we may like to think. At a ceremony Friday to commemorate the International Day of Peace on September 21st, Ban urged all combatants to lay down their arms that day. And he rang the peace bell presented to the United Nations by Japan to sound a call for peace and a day of nonviolence. The Secretary General enlisted five UN messengers of peace, DiCaprio, Gabriel Wonder, Douglas, Japanese violinist Midori, and Premier Lodge's Jane Goodall, as well as Nobel Peace Prize winners Shirin Ebadi, Lemaya Le- Le- Gobi, and Taoko Carmen to urge an end to fight and preservation of the planet. DiCaprio, who focuses on climate change, showed a short clip of, uh, for his upcoming documentary on the environment before the flood to several hundred young people at the Student Observance of International Peace Day. It also stars the Secretary General, and he says he'll be in theaters on October 21st. 
The Academy Award-winning actor says he has witnessed unimaginable human-caused devastation across our planet. He says the potential of hundreds of millions of climate refugees would create, quote, a future that would be anything but peaceful. DiCaprio says it was terrifying, but he said the solutions are available today if we begin to make real progress right now. He urged his students to hold their leaders accountable for the promises they made in last December's Paris Agreement to combat climate change and to vote for leaders who focus on renewable energy and response before it's too late. Wonder, who focuses on people with disabilities, spoke about his mother's anguish at him being blind and how he told her maybe God had something greater for him to do than to see. And he said, I'm so great, thankful that I was blessed with the gift of song and music. He says, go forward in, in the struggle for peace with passion and compassion. The future of this world is in your hands. You can do it well in this life if you do good. Love your family first, take care of your body and mind, and use God's given talent to make a difference. Douglas who focuses on disarmament and MC the student's event, spoke of the dangers of weapons of mass destruction to the planet's survival. He says an overarmed world is an unstable and insecure one. Disarmament is critical and to create a safer, more prosperous, more equitable, and more peaceful world. Goodall, who focuses on the environment, says her happiest days were studying chimpanzees in ten, uh, Tanzania, and she told the students uh, she brought a greeting for them. Ooh, ah, 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 ah. She howled to, every, to loud applause. That's hello, everybody. Goodall noted that the DNA of chimpanzees is only 1% different from the humans, but humans are so arrogant that they think they're the only beings that matter when, in fact, they have been destroying the planet that we all call home. She says we need to learn to live in peace and harmony with each other, and we need to learn to live in peace and harmony with Mother Nature. Bond, who grew up during the 1950-1953 Korean War, says that conflicts around the world are driving millions of families from their homes Homes, depriving children of an education and subjected to many to abuse and exploitation. Comedian actor Cat Williams was arrested on an outstanding warrant in Georgia after he turned himself in on a separate warrant authority set Friday. Williams, whose real name is Mika Sierra Williams, was booked into the Fulton County Jail on Thursday on a warrant charging him with second-degree criminal damage to property, jail records show. The case stems from February 28th when a man accused Williams of throwing the man's cell phone. The entertainer lawyer is Drew Findling told the Associated Press on Friday. Williams was granted bond Findling... Um, said. The person made the allegations and tried to get Williams to pay him money, and when that failed, the person pursued a warrant. Finley added, it's a ridiculous case. It's another example where Cat has a target on his forehead for somebody trying to do a financial shakedown. Police in East Point, just outside Atlanta, discovered the warrant from the alleged incident in February when Williams showed up to turn himself in Thursday on a different warrant, one issued after he failed to appear in court on charges stemming from a confrontation at an East Point restaurant. Police Captain Cliff Chandler said on Friday. Police said that during the April 27th confrontation, Williams threw a salt shaker at a restaurant manager, bloodying the employee's lip. After he was booked Thursday, East Point Police called the Fulton County Marshal Service, which sent an officer to pick Williams up on the warrant from an alleged February incident Chandler set. The comedian has been arrested several times this year at various places in Metro Atlanta and near his home in the Gainesville area northeast of the city, where he has a home in Lake Nier. A judge ruled Friday against Bobby Christina Brown's partner, Nick Gordon, in a wrongful death lawsuit filed by her estate, though the decision doesn't answer any of the questions surrounding her mysterious death. Brown, the daughter of singers Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown, was found face down and unresponsive in a bathtub in her suburban Atlanta townhome in January 2015. She died in hospice care about six months later. Investigators with the medical examiner's office were not able to determine exactly how she died. An autopsy showed that she had morphine, cocaine, alcohol and prescription drugs in her body but the medical examiners couldn't determine if she killed herself if someone else killed her or if her death was accidental her family blames gordon accusing him of lawsuits of giving her a, co a toxic cocktail before her putting her face down in the water but he has never been charged in the case fulton county district attorney paul uh, Paul Howard said in an email statement that his office continues to investigate the case. Gordon repeatedly failed to meet court deadlines in the civil case. Fulton County Superior Court Judge T. Jackson Bedford said in his order, jury trial will be set in determining how much Gordon must pay in damages. If he cannot pay, he can face a lien of property he owes or have his wages garnished. No lawyer was listed for Gordon in online court records. Two attorneys representing him against any criminal allegations that may be filed said they were not involved in 
in the civil case. Bobby Brown, who has joined the wrongful death suit filed by his daughter's estate, said in a statement released by his attorney that he is pleased with the judge's ruling. Brown said in a statement, All I ever wanted was answers relating to who and what caused my daughter's death. Today, judgment tells me it was Nick Gordon. A judge has ruled that a recorded phone call between Bill Cosby and the mother of his accuser can be used as evidence at his sexual assault trial next year. Montgomery County Judge Steve Stephen O'Neill issued the decision Friday. Cosby's lawyers asked the judge earlier this month to block prosecutors from using the 2005 telephone conversation be- because Andrea Constance's mother recorded it without his permission. Cosby was in California when he called Constance's mother at her Canadian home. His lawyers argued Pennsylvania's two-party consent law should apply plot. Neil says Canadian law prevails in this instant. In the conversation, Cosby described the sex act with Constant as digital penetration in this disposition. He says he feared sounding like a dirty old man on the call. Cosby's lawyer declined to comment Friday evening. His trial is set for next June. Corey Feldman's bizarre performance on the Today Show last week is winning kudos from at least one pop star. Pink has tweeted a message of support for the actor as he showed up some strange dance moves Friday as he led his band, Corey Angels, in a performance of Go For It. The performance was widely mocked on social media. People Magazine and other outlets reported that Feldman said in a since-deleted Facebook Live video that the criticism has been really painful and that he's never had such mean things said about me. On Twitter Sunday, Pink wrote, I love y'all, to Feldman, adding, I know how much it takes to get up there and do your thing. Keep your head up. You know that you're loved. Mariah Carey is wrapping up her two-year stint in Las Vegas with nine shows. Caesar Palace announced Monday that Carey's final shows at the Coliseum will run from April 26th through May 13th, with tickets going on sale later this month. The final show of Mariah Number 1 to Infinity will take place on May 13th. Tickets from the show range from $55 to $250. Carey's show debuted in May 2015 and catalogs her 18 number 1 singles in chronological order. As an eight-year-old in the Bronx, Vince Scully would grab a pillow, put it under his family's four-lay radio, and lay his head directly under the speaker to cure whatever college football game was on the air in 1936. With a snack of saltine crackers and a glass of milk nearby, the red-haired boy was transfixed by the crowd's roar that raised goosebumps. He thought about how much he'd like to be in the game. As time went on, he thought he'd like to call the action himself. His useful aspirations came true at 22 when he was hired by a CBS radio affiliate in Washington. To DC. The following year, he joined Red Barber and Connie Desmond in the Bro- Brooklyn Dodgers radio and television boops. In 1953, at the age of 25, Scully became the youngest person to broadcast a World Series game, a mark that still stands. Now, at 88 years old, Scully is heading into his final week behind the mic as at Dodger Stadium before concluding his career on October 2nd in San Francisco, where the Dodgers end the regular season against the rival Giants. His 67 years with the Dodgers makes Scully the longest tenure broadcaster with a single team in professional sports. He said on Monday, I will miss it. I know that dramatically. Scully discovered his lifelong love of baseball. Walking home from grade school, he passed a Chinese laundromat and saw the score from the Game 2 of the 1936 World Series. Yankees 18, Giants 4. Uh, He recalled, my first reaction was poor Giants, noting that he lived near the team's home at the Polo Grounds, attended many games for free after school. That's when I fell in love with baseball and became a true fan. Fittingly, his last game will be 80 years to the day he saw that score in the window. Uh, Scully says it seemed like the plan was laid out for me and all I had to do was follow the instructions. He has ever. Throughout the years, Scully has and trans generations of baseball fans with his dulcimit tones as he spins stories about the game and its players while working alone on the air. He still relishes the crowd's cheers, a sound he says it's like a water out of a shower head. The Dodgers plan to honor their second longest tenure employee behind former manager Tommy Lasorda starting Tuesday night with a Scully bobblehead getaway. Friday is Appreciation Day for Scully with a pregame ceremony featuring speakers from his career and a postgame fireworks show set to top to the top calls of his career. The first 50,000 fans at Saturday's game against the Colorado Rockies will receive a limited edition solid bronze coin. On the front is an image of Scully with a signature greeting of It's Time for Dodger Baseball. In San Francisco, the Giants will honor Scully at his final game. Two Bay Area television stations will carry an inning of his broadcast as stations in other cities have done this season. 
And I'll take a look at what happened on this date in entertainment history. On this date in 1946, the first Cannes Film Festival uh, opens at the resort city of Cannes in the French Riviera. The festival had intended to make its debut in September 1939, but the outbreak of World War II forced the cancellation of the inaugural Cannes. The world's first annual international film festival was inaugurated at Venice in 1932. By 1938, the Venice Film Festival had become a vehicle for fascist and Nazi propaganda, with Benito Mussolini's Italy and Adolf Hitler's Germany dictating the choices of films and shared the prizes among themselves. Outraged, France decided to organize an alternative film festival. In June of 1939, the establishment of a film festival in Cannes to be held from September 1st to the 20th was announced in Paris. Cannes, an elegant beach city, lies southeast of Nice on the Mediterranean coast. One of the resort's town's casinos agrees to host the film. The, the film event. Films were selected and the filmmakers and stars began arriving mid-August. Among the American selections was The Wizard of Oz. France offered the Nigerian and Poland the Black Diamond. The USSR brought the aptly titled Tomorrow It's War. On the morning of September 1st, the day the festival was to begin, Hitler invaded Poland. In Paris, the French government ordered a general mobilization and the Cannes Film Festival was called off after the screening of just one film. German-American director William Dietrich's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Two days later, France and Britain declare war on Germany. World War II lasted six long years. In 1946, France's providential government approved a revival of the Festival de Cannes as a means of luring tourists back to the French Riviera. The festival began on September 20th, 1946, and 18 nations were represented. The festival's schedule included Australian-American director Billy Wilder's Lost Weekend, Italian director Roberto Rossellini's Open City, French director René Clement's The Battle of the Rails, and British director David Lean's Brief and Counter. At the first cons, organizers placed more emphasis on creative stimulation between national productions than on competition. Nine films were honored with the top award Grand Prix de Festival. The Cannes Film Festival stumbled through its years, and the 1948 and 1950 festivals were canceled for economic reasons. In 1952, the Palisades de Festivals was dedicated as a permanent home for the festival. In 1955, the Palme d'Or, the Golden Palm Award for Best Film of the Festival, was introduced. An illusion of the palm planned promen- uh, promenade the cross Santan that parallels Cannes' celebrated beach. In the 50s, the Festival International du Film de Cannes came to be regarded as the most prestigious film festival in the world. It still holds that allure today, though many have criticized it as being overly commercial. More than 30,000 people come to Cannes each May to attend the festival, about 100 times the number of, fo- of film devotees who show up for the first Cannes in 1946. And as your entertainment report for Tuesday, September 20th, 2016, I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back tomorrow to deliver some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash the entertainment report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O on Twitter at the enter report or on Instagram at the entertainment report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of the entertainment report anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com or your iHeart phone app, search for the Entertainment Report, and I'll take you to the page. Good night, and God bless you all.